Hey everybody, this is Brad Dunk, just reaching out to you, saying hi. Today is a little bit of an experiment. I'm out in the lab, even though it's, it was, geez, a couple days ago, negative 39 degrees outside, and the weather here in the United States is pretty bad for a blizzard. Uh, but we're out here in the lab, and what we're going to be talking to is those steps I was talking about taking mini PCs and creating your own data center with that strategy. But the first thing you had to do is to review what you're working with, strategize how you want to use it, how to work with it, take it out of its initial design, put it into something else so you can build it into something like a Proxmox cluster environment that can run Dockers and Kubernetes and everything else you want to run. So what I'm really referring to is this. This is a 740, a 7040 style Dell Mini PC. It has an i5 processor, which I've not cleaned this one yet. It is a base board. It has 8 gigs of RAM on board. And it has a variety of features and functions, lots of USB outputs and so on. The video chipset, the SATA bus, the, M the uh, M2.0 uh, M2 here, and the wireless interface there. This is what it looks like normally when it's in its case housing, out here externally, internally, and I can take the drive housing off. And there you can see the M2 series memory, 128 gigs, a wireless module here, which is connected via by the wireless output here, the cooling fan, the chipset itself for video, and of course underneath is the principal processor. Now, here you see five modules. One completely disassembled and four that are not. Now this one that's disassembled is important to do the disassembly here because you need to know how much of this is transferable as is. And this was a little bit of a trick. Uh, something you need to understand and realize when you're dealing with mini PCs is that their case housing and handling is proprietary. And what I'm referring to are one of the most obvious ones is the screws are not all uniform. So you have a special screw somewhere that you've got to pay attention to. And if you look carefully at these screws, you're going to find something else very important about them. Double headers. Now you're probably wondering, what do you mean double header? Well, this is a double header. It is a normal size screw, but if you look at it, it has a smaller screw screwed into the top of it. Now this isn't valuable because you want to use this to secure your Wi-Fi module, which this guy goes right here and allows you to, to secure the Wi-Fi module. And of course down here you've got your M.2 standard and that is also why this second guy is here so that you can put the sub screw in there to hold down the drive. Now, this chassis housing does not show any indication of an auxiliary screw. So make sure that you don't displace your screws or misunderstand where, what screws went where. Because these three screws right here are specialized screws. It's going to be the same thing with an HP mini desktop or a Lenovo and so on and so on. They're proprietary, basically. They're not like an ATX case. Well, what can I do with this? Well, that's what I'm doing right now. You see, I've got some hard drives. I've got some M.2s. I've got substandards. I can do a paired SATA style reduced format, which you know, I could put right here if I wanted to do that. But if I'm going to do a Proxmox cluster, then I'm going to have to think a little smarter. What I'm going to have to do is I need to design. I remember when I did my data center, I told you the very first thing you got to do is get out a pencil and paper and start designing. So if I've got this small wafer-like design here, as you can see here, how can I make that fit into a small compact rack solution, provide adequate airflow, proper cabling for output, and get what we need to do done? Obviously, looking at the port interfaces, i.e. LED out, light up, aux, 
USB front end, USB back end. Of course, this is the back end because there's power here, video, and of course, Cat5, which you don't really need all of this, you can, but you do have it and it is present, so it's feasible to do. The key detail here is that your build station, which is where you'll build out the initial configuration, it doesn't have to be very special. It can be basically just enough to get the machine to post and go into network mode here, and you can do the rest via by terminal. So that means I can get rid of this. Now, will I truly get rid of this? No, not really. I'll keep them in reserve, and I'll keep the drives in reserve too, because these drives, they house operating systems, and that costs money, money I don't have, right? Because I'm doing this for free. So I will take these drives out, secure them to the side, take other drives and put them in, and provide general connectivity, capacity, and so on, and then I'll get myself a couple of one terabyte drives along with my NAS platform and afford my ability to do what I need to do. So the fun part about this is we're taking this, right, and we're breaking it, we're reinventing it, we're recreating something new. Ubuntu clusters, which can pair up resources to make them available for everything from Proxmox to Hyper-V, you name it, you can do it. And in a very, very small containment size footprint. One other very important detail in that footprint, and I wasn't kidding you, is how do you take something like this and mount these in such a way so they do what you want to do. And look how many you could put on this 19U. I mean, there's a solid 25 there. You could do, literally. Based on the depth and the width of the, the wafer board and your cooling process. But you know what? I'm kind of reevaluating this. I think I could just do better with a better heat sink than this ridiculous blower. Because once you look at these heat sinks, um, they'll actually do pretty good if they're just a little bit better, a little higher in quality, and not necessarily all that overhead. You're not really stressing this environment out, but think about it, guys. You can take these strategies, you extend them out. This is called an extendable style shelf, which means you can put the principal electronics here and put subframing framing in here to hold, you know, to hold everything stable. And that can be your, your baseline. And then you can put additional add-on brackets here to do things like cable management or power distribution management and so on and so on. So, with that being said, we want to make sure that we're looking at the total picture. The total picture is simple. These ran me about 80 bucks each. So, that's pretty doggone cheap. I have everything I need. I have the memory, I have the processing, I have the storage. I have everything I need. The only thing I don't need, necessarily, is some of the baggage, right? Case housing and so on. Then it's up to me what I want to install on these units and how I want to host them inside my rack enclosure. And how do you deal with the storage capacity? You know, that's a good question, but I have an, an answer for that. Let me show you. So you remember back when, when my Raspberry Pis were running in the background, and it was basically a, what I call a, a, a test bed cluster, uh, that I also had above these ice docks, these icy dock enclosure structures, which have series of drives in them. You know, two terabyte drives each is quite a bit of storage here. So with that being the case, I also have to make sure that they're 3.0 compliant, which looky there, they are 3.0 compliant and they're actually eSATA compliant as well. So I've got power, I've got output, I've got capacity. So maybe I can host my shelving of my array here above this block and I could have one controller node with no storage capacity, three nodes, with capacity and maybe a fourth node in the equation that can act as a load balancer or a failover. So when it comes to capacity and planning, remember what I told you, you know, sitting down and taking your paper, and here by the way if you look is the enclosure I was talking about. This is a shelving enclosure and it has a set bracket. And here's a so support bracket here for power outputs and of course plenty of room up here to do that. So this is a great idea of how you can take advantage of redesigning implementations the way you want them. Now this one is a little different because when you look at it, these are raised at an angle. Um, 
because they have the front mounting doors that open, so I have to put them in a slight angle. But that's okay, that won't affect anything. This is just a way to get what needs to be done. So with that being said, you know, when you take a look at some of the components that are on this motherboard, and it is a motherboard, uh, it's actually a tier set motherboard, which means it actually has a full set of 64-bit pathways on it. I can tell by the underside of it that it has that capacity. Um, unlike laptops, which have a split bus, which can be used in 64-bit mode too, but it has, it's accomplished by two busing of 32-bit pathways. That allows you to not have so much uh, pathing on the logic board, and you can have a lot smaller basic board or processor board than that of like a true motherboard where it has the redundancy pathways. That's something to take a look at. Now, the bad news is if I go this route, then my, my wireless feature and function is dead. Because, as you can see, it stays behind with the actual unit itself, which kind of sucks, but not necessarily. Um, you know, you could use the Wi-Fi as an internal closed loop NAT translation Wi-Fi network to do the intercommunication. But, of course, by doing that, you could create yourself a security risk of having a self-autonomous network within a network. You don't want to necessarily do that, but it could be fun to play with. Something to think about. Another thing to think about is when you're going to start doing clustering, you might discover as you're doing things that one unit here has 16 gigs on board, and then the next unit you check doesn't. It has something more like um, 8 gigs. And that's basically kind of the norm with these units. I did get one unit with 16 gigs on board, and I'll show you what I mean. Here you have a unit that was just opened up, and it's got dust and garbage in it, but there is an 8-gig stick, while over here there were two 8-gigs. So one thing you want to make sure you start to do immediately is when you start classifying your cluster, right on a piece of paper, you want to match the resources, the size of the hard drives in this case, the, two, the M2s is what I'm going to work with in this particular format, I think. And that should give us the ability here of um, allowing us to keep the formats, keep the standards all consistently the same. You know, I have wireless modules here. They need to go. Same here, but these are SATA drives. There is no M2, so I've ordered those replacements. Again, here's another one. And, uh, of course, this one down here had... Uh, nothing actually it was empty no drive capacity whatsoever so i basically had to order a stick for that as well so the good news is i'm good and i actually have a little bit more resource than i expected and i'll put that back in there just to keep it safe but with that being said take all of this into account make sure you match everything up even go to the extent of flashing the bios make sure the bios is stable and up to date and they're all in the same version of bios because you're going to build a cluster, you know, and you've got to do this. With that being said, we are going to talk to the next phase, and that's is how am I going to put this together? You know, what's it going to look like? Is it going to be like a sleeve edge? I'm pretty much sure I can't do that. I wish I could. I think it's going to be a set bevel. I'll create a base where I can screw things in, put the base in, and lock the base in by a screw, and that will keep everything nice and stable for the most part. Uh, all in all, though, it's fun. You know, it's an opportunity to, to take something that people throw away, and that's what the industry wants you to do. They want you to throw away the old PCs, buy new, keep, you know, buying whatever they recommend. Just don't listen to the fact that your hardware has more life to it than it, you really thought it was. I mean, if you look at these guys, these are, these are i5, 6500s. i5s, quad, hyperthread, core set. That's eight threads a stack, and I've got five of them here. That's a lot of firepower, and it uses less energy than a 2U does with the same equal compute value. Which is really interesting, don't you think? So, with that, hence the word. We'll break it, we'll fix it, bring it back to life, and make it into something new. Well, this is Brad Dyke. I'm signing off. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please stay warm, and have a blessed weekend.